Item Number SCP-173 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures Item SCP-173 is to be kept in a locked container at all times. When personnel must enter SCP-173's container, no fewer than three may enter at any time, and the door is to be relocked behind them. At all times, two persons must maintain direct eye contact with SCP-173 until all personnel have vacated and relocked the container. Description Moved to Site-19 in 1993. Origin is as of yet unknown. It is constructed from concrete and rebar, with traces of Krylon brand spray paint. SCP-173 is animate and extremely hostile. The object cannot move while within a direct line of sight. Line of sight must not be broken at any time with SCP-173. Personnel assigned to enter container are instructed to alert one another before blinking. Object is reported to attack by snapping the neck at the base of the skull, or by strangulation. In the event of an attack, personnel are to observe Class 4 hazardous object containment procedures. Personnel report sounds of scraping stone originating from within the container when no one is present inside. This is considered normal and any change in this behavior should be reported to the acting HMCL supervisor on duty. The reddish-brown substance on the floor is a combination of feces and blood. Origin of these materials is unknown. The enclosure must be cleaned on a bi-weekly basis. Item Number SCP-055 Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures Object is kept within a 5 meter by 5 meter by 2.5 meter square room, constructed of cement, 50 centimeter thickness, with a Faraday cage surrounding the cement walls. Access is via a heavy containment door, measuring 2 by 2.5 meters, constructed on bearings to ensure door closes and locks automatically, unless held open deliberately. Security guards are not to be posted outside SCP-055's room. It is further advised that all personnel maintaining or studying other SCP objects in the vicinity try to maintain a distance of at least 50 meters from the geometric center of the room, as long as this is reasonably practical. Description SCP-055 is a self-keeping secret, or anti-meme. Information about SCP-055's physical appearance, as well as its nature, behavior, and origins, is self-classifying. To clarify, how Site-19 originally acquired SCP-055 is unknown. When SCP-055 was obtained, and by whom, is unknown. SCP-055's physical appearance is unknown. It is not indescribable or invisible. Individuals are perfectly capable of entering SCP-055's container and observing it, taking mental or written notes, making sketches, taking photographs, and even making audio-video recordings. An extensive log of such observations is on file. However, information about SCP-055's physical appearance leaks out of a human mind soon after such an observation. Individuals tasked with describing SCP-055 afterwards find their minds wandering and lose interest in the task. Individuals tasked with sketching a copy of a photograph of SCP-055 are unable to remember what the photograph looks like as are researchers overseeing these tests. Security personnel who have observed SCP-055 via closed-circuit television cameras emerge after a full shift exhausted and effectively amnesiac about the events of the previous hours. Who authorized the construction of SCP-055's containment room? Why it was constructed in this way? Or what the purpose of the described containment procedures may be are all unknown. Despite SCP-055's container being easily accessible, all personnel at Site-19 claim no knowledge of SCP-055's existence when challenged. All of these facts are periodically rediscovered, usually by chance readers of this file, causing a great deal of alarm. This state of concern lasts minutes at most, before the matter is simply forgotten about. A great deal of scientific data has been recorded from SCP-055, but cannot be studied. At least one attempt has been made to destroy SCP-055, 
or possibly move it from containment at Site-19 to another site, meeting failure for reasons unknown. SCP-055 may present a major physical threat, and indeed may have killed many hundreds of personnel, and we would not know it. Certainly it presents a gigantic mimetic mental threat, hence its Keter classification. Document 055-1 An Analysis of SCP-055 the author puts forward the hypothesis that SCP-055 was never formally acquired by and is in fact an autonomous or remotely controlled agent, inserted at Site-19 by an unidentified third party, for one or all of the following purposes. To silently observe or interfere with activities at Site-19. To silently observe or interfere with activities at other SCP locations. To silently observe or interfere with activities of humanity, worldwide to silently observe or interfere with other SCP objects, to silently observe or interfere with No action to counter any of these potential threats is suggested, or indeed theoretically possible. Addendum A Hey, if this thing really is an anti-meme, why doesn't the fact that it's an anti-meme get wiped? We must be wrong about that somehow. Wait a minute, what if we were to keep notes about what it isn't? Would we remember those? Bartholomew Hughes, NSA. Document 055-2. Report of Dr. John Marichek. Survey Team Number 19-055-127-BXE was successfully able to enter SCP-055's container and ascertain the appearance and, to some degree, the nature of the object. Notes were taken according to the project methodology, after which the container was sealed again. Excerpt from a transcript of personnel debriefing follows. Dr. Hughes. Okay, I'm going to need to ask you some questions about number 55 now. Interviewee. Number what? Dr. Hughes. SCP Object 55, the object you just examined. Interviewee. Um, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't think we have a 55. Dr. Hughes. Okay then. I'd like you to tell me what you've been doing for the past two hours. Interviewee. What? I... Subject appears uncomfortable. I don't know. Dr. Hughes. Okay then. Do you remember that we all agreed that it wasn't spherical? Interviewee. That what wasn't? Oh, right. It isn't round at all. Object 55 isn't round. Dr. Hughes. So you remember it now? Interviewee. Well, no. I mean, I don't know what it is, but I know there is one. It's something you can't remember, and it's not a sphere. Dr. Hughes. Wait a minute. What's not a sphere? Interviewee. Object 55. Dr. Hughes. Object what? Interviewee. Doc, do you remember agreeing that something wasn't shaped like a sphere? Dr. Hughes. Oh, right. It appears to be possible to remember what SCP-055 is not, negations of fact and to repeatedly deduce its existence from these memories. Personnel involved in Survey 19-055-127-BXE reported moderate levels of disorientation and psychological trauma associated with cycles of repeated memory and forgetfulness of SCP-055. However, no long-term behavioral or health problems were observed, and psych assessments of survey personnel showed consistent reports of this distress fading over time. Recommendations it may be worthwhile to post at least one staff member capable of remembering the existence of SCP-055 to each critical site. Item Number SCP-087 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-087 is located on the campus of The doorway leading to SCP-087 is constructed of reinforced steel with an electro-release lock mechanism. It has been disguised to resemble a janitorial closet consistent with the design of the building. The lock mechanism on the doorknob will not release unless volts are applied in conjunction with counterclockwise rotation of the key. The inside of the door is lined with 6 centimeters of industrial foam padding. Due to the results of the final exploration, no personnel are permitted access to SCP-087. Description SCP-087 is an unlit platform staircase. Stairs descend on a 38-degree angle for 13 steps, 
before reaching a semicircular platform of approximately 3 meters in diameter. Descent direction rotates 180 degrees at each platform. The design of SCP-087 limits subjects to a visual range of approximately 1.5 flights. A light source is required for any subjects exploring SCP-087, as there are no lighting fixtures or windows present. Lighting sources brighter than 75 watts have shown to be ineffective, as SCP-087 seems to absorb excess light. Subjects report and audio recordings confirm the distressed vocalizations from what is presumed to be a child, between the ages of and The source of the distress calls is estimated to be located approximately 200 meters below the initial platform. However, any attempts to descend the staircase have failed to bring subjects closer to the source. The depth of descent calculated from Exploration 4, the longest exploration, is shown to be far beyond both the possible structure of both the building and geological surroundings. At this time, it is unknown if SCP-087 has an endpoint. SCP-087 has undergone four video-recorded explorations by Class D personnel. Each subject conducting an exploration has encountered SCP-087-1 which appears as a face with no visible pupils, nostrils, or mouth. The nature of SCP-087-1 is entirely unclear, but it has been determined that it is not the source of the pleading. Subjects exhibit feelings of intense paranoia and fear when faced with SCP-087-1, but it is undetermined whether said feelings are abnormal or simply natural reactions. Addendum Over a period of two weeks following Exploration 4, Several members of the staff and students from the campus reported knocking at a variable rate of 1 to 2 seconds per knock, coming from the interior of SCP-087. The door leading to SCP-087 has been fitted with 6 centimeter thick industrial padding. All reports of knocking have ceased. Authorized personnel may refer to documents 0871 through 0874 for transcripts of explorations 1 through 4. Document 0871, Exploration 1. D-8432 is a 43-year-old Caucasian male of average build and appearance, and unremarkable psychological background. Class D designation is a result of demotion due to mishandling SCP- D-8432 is equipped with a 75-watt flood lamp, with battery power capable of lasting 24 hours, a handheld camcorder fitted with a transmission stream, and an audio headset for communication with Dr. that control. D-8432 steps through the doorway onto the initial platform. Despite the wattage, the flood lamp only illuminates the first nine steps. The second platform is not visible. D-8432, it's f dark. Doctor, is your flood lamp functioning properly? D-8432 shines the light out the door and into the academic building's hallway the light reaches significantly further. D-8432 Yeah, it's working. It just won't light these stairs all the way down. Doctor Thank you. Please continue. D-8432 descends for 13 steps before reaching the second platform. The platform is in the shape of a semicircle, with an apparently concrete surface and walls. There are no distinct markings, aside from nondescript patches of dust, dirt, or wear consistent with that which is found in a typical concrete stairwell. D-8432 rotates 180 degrees to begin descent down the second flight, then pauses. Doctor, reason for stopping? D-8432, you hear that? There's a f***ing kid down there. Sounds like one. None of the described audio is feeding through the camera or mic at this time. Doctor, could you please describe the sound? D-8432, it's young, either female or a very young boy. It's crying and sobbing and saying, please, help, please. Yeah, it keeps repeating that and crying. Doctor, can you estimate its distance from your current location? D-8432, ah, uh, fuck, I don't know, maybe 200 meters down? Doctor, please continue down the next flight. The subject descends another 13 steps. As he reaches the landing, audio of the child as described is picked up. The child alternates between sobbing, wailing, and the words please, help, and down here. 
The level of audio is consistent with D8432's report of it being approximately 200 meters below. Doctor, can you still hear the crying? D8432, yeah. Doctor, we're picking it up as well. Please continue down. Stop if you notice any changes in the audio or environment. The subject ascends another three flights of stairs before stopping. D8432, keep going? Doctor, please. D8432 continues another 17 flights, total of 22 flights, before stopping. There are no visual changes in the environment, and each flight has been a consistent 13 steps. D8432, I'm not getting any f closer to the kid. Stereo audio confirms that the crying noise has not increased in volume and remains approximately 200 meters below the subject. Doctor. Noted. Please continue. The subject continues another 28 flights before stopping, 50 flights total. D8432 is standing on the 51st landing, counting the initial ground level landing. D8432 is estimated to be 200 meters below the initial platform. 34 minutes have elapsed. The volume of the crying has not increased. D8432, I feel a little uneasy. Doctor, you spent a long time in a dark, unknown stairwell. It's natural. Please continue. The subject hesitates before stepping down on the next stair. As the subject moves forward, the flood lamp illuminates a face, located approximately at the bottom of the flight, SCP-0871. It appears to be the same size and shape as a human head, except it is lacking a mouth, nostrils, and pupils. The face is completely motionless, but is making direct eye contact, indicating its awareness of D8432. D8432, yelling, F***, what the f is that? Doctor, can you please describe what you see? D8432, it's some sort of f person face thing and it's looking right at me. Doctor, is it moving? D8432, pause heavy breathing. No, it's just staring at me. Fuck, it's creepy. Doctor, please approach and further illuminate the entity. D8432, fuck, I don't want to. F the face jerks forward about 50 centimeters directly toward D8432. D8432, yelling. D8432 enters a panicked state and rapidly ascends SCP-087. D8432 reaches the ground floor in 18 minutes, at which time he collapses and passes out. There is no sign of SCP-087-1. Review of the footage indicates an equal number of flights and steps ascending as descending. Audio of the crying and pleading remains at the same volume until the last flight, at which point it ceases. Medical reports indicate collapse was a result of the rapid ascension of the stairs, causing fatigue. Document 0872, Exploration 2. D9035 is a 28-year-old African-American male of strong build. Psychological background indicates no abnormalities, except an extreme hatred for women. Subject has an extensive record of data expunged. D9035 is equipped with a 100-watt flood lamp with battery power, capable of lasting 24 hours, a handheld camcorder fitted with a transmission stream, and an audio headset for communication with Dr. that control. D9035 is also equipped with a backpack containing 100 small LED lights with adhesive backs and battery lives of approximately three weeks. Lights turn on and off by compressing them. D9035 shines the flood lamp down the first flight of stairs. Despite the extra wattage, the light does not illuminate beyond the ninth step. D9035, you want me to go down there, Doc? Doctor, please shine your flood lamp outside of SCP-087 to verify it is functioning properly. D9035 shines the light into the hallway. Comparison with the footage from Exploration 1 confirms it is indeed brighter. Doctor, thank you. Please continue to the first landing. D9035. Hey doc, I know what you said and all, but I don't think I want to go there. Doctor, please continue to the first landing. D9035. Doc, look, I... Doctor, interrupting. As per our earlier conversation, 
Please continue to the first landing. D9035 pauses for 18 seconds, then descends 13 steps to the first landing and stops. D9035, is that a kid? Doctor, please remove one of the adhesive lights and affix it to the wall on the landing. D9035, Doc, you hear that? Is that a kid down there? Doctor, that's unconfirmed. Please affix an adhesive light to the wall and verify it functions. D9035 hesitates, then removes one of the lights from his backpack and adheres it to the wall. He presses on the light and it turns on. Doctor, please turn off your flood lamp. D9035 hesitates again before turning off the lamp. The LED light illuminates the landing, but does not extend beyond the first step either way. Doctor, thank you. You may turn your flood lamp back on. Please continue to descend. At each landing, affix an LED light to the wall and turn it on. If you notice anything unusual, please report it. D9035 turns the flood lamp back on, then descends the next flight of stairs. As he sets foot on the landing, the audio picks up sounds of pleading and crying, consistent with those of the first exploration. Doctor, can you still hear the previously reported audio? D9035, uh, yeah. She sounds about 150, maybe 200 meters down. Am I supposed to get her? Look, Doc, I don't do good with kids. Doctor, please place the light and continue down until you notice anything unusual. The subject adheres the light to the wall and turns it on, then continues to the next landing. He adheres the third LED light to the wall and turns it on. D9035 continues in this manner for the next 25 flights before stopping. D9035, I don't think I'm getting any closer to the kid, Doc. Doctor, how far below would you estimate the source of the sound to be? D9035, same as before, 150 to 200 meters down. Doctor, thank you. Please proceed. D9035 continues in the same fashion for the next 24 flights. At the 51st landing, he stops. Footage shows an arced gouge in the concrete wall, estimated to be approximately 50 centimeters long and 10 centimeters wide. The first step down from the landing appears to be completely smashed into rubble. D9035, you see that? Doctor, yes. Can you please describe what you see? D9035, looks like something slashed at the wall and the step over here is all crumbled up and stuff. The slash mark looks really smooth. D9035 touches the gouge mark. D9035, yeah, it's smooth. Feels like glass. Doctor, thank you. Please continue down. D9035. Look, Doc, I think I've gone far enough. Doctor, please continue as per our agreement. D9035. I don't want to be doing this. Agreement or not. Data expunged. D9035 steps over the destroyed step and continues down the staircase. Nothing is notable at the next landing. D9035 adheres an LED light to the wall and continues in the same fashion for another 38 flights. The sound of the crying and pleading still has not gotten closer. D9035 is on the 89th landing and 74 minutes have elapsed from the beginning of the exploration. Subject is estimated to be 350 meters below the initial platform. D9035 I feel like the kid's just trying to lure me down here, Doc. I think it's time for me to... D9035 stops talking and moving as the flood lamp illuminates SCP-087-1. The face is staring directly at D9035, again indicating awareness of the subject's presence. Although SCP-087-1 appears to be unmoving, its location is 38 flights below the initial counter in Exploration 1, indicating it is mobile. Doctor, is there a reason you stopped? D9035 unresponsive. D9035's breathing grows labored. SCP-087-1 remains immobile for an additional 13 seconds. SCP-087-1 blinks. D9035, yelling, incomprehensible. SCP-087-1 jerks forward until it is approximately 90 centimeters from D9035. 
Subject turns and flees up the stairs. Doctor, please relax and calm down. Turn around. We need a closer look at the face. D-9035 ignores Doctor and continues rapid ascent. He continues to scream incomprehensibly. Doctor, D-9035, can you hear me? Please slow down. D-9035 is unresponsive and continues rapidly climbing the stairs. His screaming diminishes to babbling. After ascending 72 flights, D-9035 collapses on the 17th landing. Doctor, D-9035, can you hear me? D-9035 is unresponsive, but labored breathing can be heard through the audio feed. For the next 14 minutes, D-9035 is immobile. The visual feed is black, and the audio picks up only the subject's breathing and the continuous pleading coming from below. After 14 minutes and 32 seconds of unchanging visual and audio feeds, the sound of a rapid heartbeat not consistent with a human heartbeat and a low cracking noise is heard. Seven seconds later, D-9035 gasps and revives, continuing his ascent of the stairs rapidly and wordlessly. The heartbeat and cracking cease, and nothing abnormal is detected on the visual feed. He remains unresponsive. D-9035 exits SCP-087 and sits on the floor outside of the entrance. D-9035 then enters a catatonic state from which he has not yet recovered. Document 087-3 Exploration 3 D-9884 is a 23-year-old female of average build and appearance. Psychological background indicates a history of depression. Subject has a minimal record of using excessive force to data expunged. D-9884 is equipped with a 75-watt flood lamp with battery power, capable of lasting 24 hours, a handheld camcorder fitted with a transmission stream, and an audio headset for communication with Dr. Beck Control. D-9884 is also equipped with a backpack containing 3.75 liters of water, 15 nutrient bars, and one thermal blanket. D-9884 stands on the ground level landing of SCP-087. The flood lamp illuminates only the first nine steps. LED lights placed on the wall during the last exploration are not visible. Doctor, please descend the first flight and examine the landing wall. D-9884 descends 13 steps and stops at the landing. There is no trace of the LED light at the location footage from Exploration 2 indicates it was placed. D-9884, yeah, um, it's just a dirty concrete wall. There's like nothing on it. No, wait, it's a little bit sticky right here. D-9884 indicates the spot on the wall the LED light should have been located. D-9884. There's a child crying down there. She's... she's begging for help and crying. Doctor, thank you. Please continue down the steps until you notice anything unusual. D-9884 descends. Upon reaching the next landing, audio of the crying child consistent with the prior two explorations is picked up. No LED lights appear to be present on any of the landing walls. D-9884 continues with no incident until she reaches the 17th landing. D-9884. Ew, there's something on the ground here, and it smells really bad. It's all sticky and stuck on my shoe. Ugh, it's so gross. Video feed confirms presence of substance occupying a space approximately 50 centimeters in diameter. Doctor, can you describe the scent? D-9884. Uh, it kind of smells like old rusty metal and pee. Doctor, thank you. Please continue until you notice anything else. D-9884 continues to the 51st landing without incident. The 51st landing remains unchanged from the previous expedition, and similar observations are made. D-9884 is asked again to descend until anything unusual is noticed. Subject continues her descent until the 89th landing is reached. The video feed jerks and the subject yells. D-9884, ah, f there's a hole in the ground, and I almost fell in. Video feed confirms the presence of a hole, approximately one meter in diameter. The subject shines the floodlight down, revealing only blackness. Approximately four seconds pass, and a light of an indeterminate distance down the hole flicks on for approximately two seconds, and then back off. D-9884. There was a light down there. It's gone now, but it was on for like a second. Did you see it? 
Doctor. Yes. Can you estimate the depth of this hole? D9884. No way. It's too deep. At least a kilometer. Like, way more than a kilometer. Doctor. Thank you. Can you still hear the sounds of the child? D9884. Uh-huh. She still sounds far away. I don't feel like I'm getting any closer. It's like for every step I take, she takes one down. Doctor. Please continue down until you encounter anything unusual. D9884 continues to descend SCP-087 for approximately an hour, covering an additional 164 flights. She stops to rest on the 253rd landing, consuming one nutrient bar and several gulps of water. D9884 is at an estimated 1.1 kilometers below the initial landing, yet the sound of the child has not changed in volume. After pausing for four minutes, D9884 resumes her descent, making no stops for another 216 flights, 1.5 hours later. D9884 is on the 469th landing, an approximate 1.8 kilometers below the ground level. D9884, I'm not getting anywhere. I think it's time I went back. I mean, going down is one thing, but this is a long climb back. Doctor, you have been provided with food, water, and blankets to last you 24 hours. Please continue down. D9884. No. I think I'm gonna go back up. D9884 turns towards the previous flight of stairs. D9884. I. Screams. SCP-0871. The face. Is directly behind 9884. Blocking her ascent. The face appears approximately 30 centimeters from the lens of the camera. Its eyes are fixed directly on the lens, this time looking not at the subject, but the person viewing the video feed. The video feed glitches and freezes for four seconds, accompanied by a static-like screeching noise from the audio feed. It then cuts to bumpy visuals of D9884 descending the stairs rapidly. D9884, panicked and hysterical. It's been following me. This whole time it's been right behind me. Oh god, it's right behind me, it was looking right at me. Doctor- Please do something, please, please help me, oh god, no, please get it away, please, no, please. I knew it was following me. Help make it leave, please, no, it was looking at me, it was staring at me, it knew I was here, it's been watching me this whole time, oh god, please help me, no, please. This continues in a similar fashion, until the end. D9884 continues to scream and plead hysterically as she rapidly descends the staircase. The previously heard static-like screeching seems to overlay the audio feed beneath which can still be heard the original sound of the crying child. Approximately 14 flights down, the video feed swings to show the area directly behind D9884. The face is now approximately 20 centimeters from the camera lens. It is not staring at the subject, rather it is fixated on the camera lens, giving the illusion it is making eye contact with those viewing the footage. It is important to note that since the sighting of SCP-087-1, the sound of the crying girl and pleading has been increasing in volume, indicating D9884 is nearing the source. After an approximate 150 panicked flights of descent, with three visual confirmations of SCP-087-1 still in pursuit, D9884 trips and appears to fall unconscious. Audio feed indicates strong proximity to the source of the crying. The static and screeching noise continue. Video feed shows yet another descending flight of stairs indicating D9884 still has not reached the base of the stairwell. Twelve seconds of motionlessness pass before the face comes in full view of the camera, eye contact being made directly with the viewer. Audio and video feeds cut out, and no connection is re-established. Item Number SCP-096 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-096 is to be contained in its cell, a 5 meter by 5 meter by 5 meter airtight steel cube, at all times. Weekly checks for any cracks or holes are mandatory. There are to be absolutely no video surveillance or optical tools of any kind inside SCP-096's cell. Security personnel will use pre-installed pressure sensors and laser detectors to ensure SCP-096's presence inside the cell. Any and all photos, video, or recordings of SCP-096's likeness are strictly forbidden, without approval from Dr. and O5. Description SCP-096 is a humanoid creature 
measuring approximately 2.38 meters in height. Subject shows very little muscle mass, with preliminary analysis of body mass suggesting mild malnutrition. Arms are grossly out of proportion with the rest of the subject's body, with an approximate length of 1.5 meters each. Skin is mostly devoid of pigmentation, with no sign of any body hair. SCP-096's jaw can open to four times the norm of an average human. Other facial features remain similar to an average human, with the exception of the eyes, which are also devoid of pigmentation. It is not yet known whether SCP-096 is blind or not. It shows no signs of any higher brain functions and is not considered to be sapient. SCP-096 is normally extremely docile with pressure sensors inside its cell indicating it spends most of the day pacing by the eastern wall. However, when someone views SCP-096's face, whether it be directly, via video recording, or even a photograph, it will enter a stage of considerable emotional distress. SCP-096 will cover its face with its hands and begin screaming, crying, and babbling incoherently. Approximately one to two minutes after the first viewing, SCP-096 will begin running to the person who viewed its face, who will from this point on be referred to as SCP-096-1. Documented speeds have varied from 35 kilometers an hour to kilometers an hour, and seems to depend on distance from SCP-096-1. At this point, no known material or method can impede SCP-096's progress. The actual position of SCP-096-1 does not seem to affect SCP-096's response. It seems to have an innate sense of SCP-096-1's location. Note, this reaction does not occur when viewing artistic depictions. Upon arriving at SCP-096-1's location, SCP-096 will proceed to kill and data expunged SCP-096-1. 100% of cases have left no traces of SCP-096-1. SCP-096 will then sit down for several minutes before regaining its composure and becoming docile once again. It will then attempt to make its way back to its natural habitat due to the possibility of a mass chain reaction, including breach of Foundation secrecy and large civilian loss of life. Retrieval of subjects should be considered alpha priority. Dr. has also petitioned for an immediate termination of SCP-096. Termination order has been approved. Audio log from Interview 096-1. Interviewer, Dr. Interviewed, Captain, Retired. Former Commander of Retrieval Team Zulu-9A. Retrieval Incident 096-1A. Begin log. Captain, it always sucks ass to get initial retrieval duty. You have no idea what the damn thing is capable of, besides what jacked up information the field techies can scrape up, and you're lucky if they even tell you the whole story. They told us to bag and tag. Didn't tell us jack sh about not looking at the damn thing. Doctor, could you describe the mission, please? Captain, yeah, sorry. We had two choppers, one with my team, and one on backup with the Zulu 9B and Dr. We spotted the target about two clicks north of our patrol path. I'm guessing he wasn't facing our direction, else he would have taken us out then and there. Doctor, your report says SCP-096 didn't react to the cold. It was minus degrees Celsius. Captain, actually, it was minus And yes, it was butt naked and didn't so much as shiver. Anyway, we landed, approached the target, and Corporal got ready to bag it. That's when the doctor called. I turned to answer it, and that's what saved me. The target must have turned, and my whole squad saw it. Doctor, that's when SCP-096 entered an agitated emotional state. Captain, yep, sorry, got the willies for a second. Doctor, that's all right. Captain, yeah, well, I never saw its face. My squad did, and they paid for it up the ass. Doctor. Could you describe it a little more, please? Captain. Yeah, yeah. It started screaming at us and crying. Not animal roaring, though. Sounded exactly like a person. Really f***ing creepy. We started firing when it picked up Corporal and ripped off his leg. God, he was screaming for our help. F*** A. Anyway, we were blowing chunks out of the target, round after round. 
didn't do jack shit. I almost lost it when it started data expunged him. Doctor, that's when you ordered the use of an AT-4 HEDT launcher. Captain, an anti-tank gun. Started carrying it ever since SCP got loose. I've seen those tear through tanks like tissue paper. Did the same thing to the target. Doctor, there was significant damage to SCP-096? Captain, it didn't even f***ing flinch. It kept tearing apart my squad, but with half of its torso gone. He draws a large half circle across his torso. Doctor, but it was taking damage. Captain, if it was, it wasn't showing it. It must have lost all its organs, all its blood, but it didn't acknowledge any of it. Its bone structure wasn't hurt at all, though. It kept tearing my squad apart. Doctor, so no actual structural damage. How many rounds would you say were fired at SCP-096? Captain, at the least, a thousand. Our door gunner kept his GAU-19 on it for at least 20 seconds. 20 f***ing seconds. That's 650 caliber rounds pumped into the thing. Might as well have been spitting at it. Doctor, this is when Zulu-9B arrived. Captain, yeah, and my squad was gone. Zulu-9B managed to get the bag over its head, and it just sat down. We got it into the chopper and got it here. I don't know how I never saw its face. Maybe God or Buddha or whoever thought I should live. The jackass. Doctor, we have obtained an artist's depiction of SCP-096's face. Would you like to view it? Captain, pauses. You know, after hearing that thing's screams and the screams of my men, I don't think I want to put a face to what I heard. No. Just... No. Doctor. Alright, I believe we are done here. Thank you, Captain. Chairs are heard moving, and footsteps leave the room. Captain is confirmed to have left interview room 22. Doctor. Let this be on record that I am formally requesting SCP-096 be terminated. As soon as possible. End log. Documentation 0961 of Experiment 0961. Experiment 0961 is headed by Dr. Dan. Purpose is to test SCP-096's abilities while obtaining complete physical description of SCP-096. D-9031 is a 32-year-old convicted felon and former tattoo artist. D-9031 is placed inside Bathyspear 303A, which is then lowered into the Tonga Trench off the coast of New Zealand. The following was recorded via video surveillance inside Bathyspear 303A between it and Dr. Dan's control site on the New Zealand mainland. Bathyspear 303A reaches final depth of 10,800 meters. D-9031. It stopped. What now? Dr. Dan, do you feel fine? No sickness? Anything? D-9031. My ears hurt. Dr. Dan, that should be expected. Now, on your left should be a steel container. Open it, and there will be a manila folder holding several photographs. Open it and describe the first photograph, please. D-9031 complies. The camera is located so the photograph cannot be seen. D-9031. Nothing. It's an empty cell. Dr. Dan. Thank you. Please set this photograph down in the receptacle to your right and look at the next photograph. D-9031. It's the same cell, but there's a foot in it, I think. Dr. Dan. Describe it, please. D-9031. Uh, it's pale and bony. Sort of creepy, actually. Dr. Dan. Place the photograph in the receptacle, face down, and look at the next one. D-9031. Okay. Pause. Oh, shit. Dr. Dan. Describe the photograph. D-9031. It's a... I don't know, some creepy ass person. Dr. Dan, describe the photograph, please. D-9031. Hell, man. He's pale, has white eyes, and something f***ed up is happening with his mouth. What the hell is this thing? At this point, approximately 1332 standard time, Dr. Dan and Experiment Control is notified that SCP-096 has breached containment. The fastest path to SCP-0961 has been cleared of civilians and other image-capturing devices 
and SCP-096 is now being tracked by satellites via tracking collar. Dr. Dan, on your right there should be another steel container. Open it. SCP-096-1, it's a pad of paper and a pencil. Dr. Dan, yes. Please draw a sketch of the photograph you saw. SCP-096-1 mumbles an expletive and spends the next 20 minutes drawing a sketch of the photograph. At the time of completion, SCP-096 is confirmed to be kilometers away from SCP-096-1. SCP-096-1, I'm done. Dr. Dan, good. Place the drawing in the receptacle on your left and close the door. SCP-096-1 complies and the sketch leaves Bathysphere 303A in a watertight buoyancy container. The other photographs are then incinerated in the onboard incinerator. SCP-096-1, what now? Dr. Dan, please stand by. 40 minutes pass. SCP-096 is now confirmed to be at SCP-096-1's position and is diving. Transponder signal ends at 9,339 meters as pressure goes beyond the device's operational limits. The camera shows the bathysphere shaking slightly. From SCP-096-1's reaction, it is assumed SCP-096 is on the hull and is visible through the viewport. SCP-096-1 Oh f shit, 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 shit. What the fuck is that? Video and audio feed is cut as the hull of Bathysphere 303A is breached. SCP-096 is recovered by Surface Recovery Team Foxtrot 303A without incident. Sketch of SCP-096 is also recovered, and a quick test confirms no hostile reaction from SCP-096. Sketch is sent to experiment control on New Zealand, while SCP-096 is moved to permanent containment. Item Number SCP-093 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-093 must remain on a mirror at all times and under video surveillance. Admittance into the area of SCP-093's containment must be authorized only with proper video recording and subject retrieval procedures in place. Any attempt to use SCP-093 outside of an approved test will be dealt with severely, up to and including termination. Description SCP-093 is a primarily red disc carved from a stone composite resembling cinnabar with circular engravings and unknown symbols carved at 0.5 cm depth around the entire object. Deeper cuts are present on SCP-093 with a depth of 1 to 1.5 cm. SCP-093 is 7.62 cm in diameter and fits comfortably into most palms without abrasion. SCP-093 will change hue when held by a living individual. The colors taken by SCP-093 are still being researched to establish a link. Current belief holds that the changes depend upon regrets carried by the holder. If SCP-093 is removed from a mirror and not held by a person, it will seek out the nearest mirror-like surface. SCP-093 has been observed to travel in the largest possible circle while rolling, building up phenomenal speed. The mechanism of this acceleration is currently unknown. If an object is between SCP-093 and the nearest mirror-like surface, it will use this momentum to punch through the obstacle and continue on its course at this speed. It will only stop when a mirror-like surface is contacted. Despite tremendous impact velocities, no damage will be dealt to SCP-093 or the mirror. Additional Notes no records exist to clarify the nature of SCP-093's discovery or presence in the Foundation. Since no records exist explaining SCP-093's method of containment, a test procedure was initiated to establish why mirrors must be used to contain it. The results of SCP-093-T1 led to the discovery of living beings holding SCP-093 being able to move through mirrors and the series of tests in SCP-093-T2 to ascertain the destination reached through this travel. SCP-093 Original Documentation Item Number SCP-093 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures Item SCP-093 is to be kept on a silver-lined mirror on a 0x3x0.23 meter 
or 1 foot by 9 inch pedestal, at least 1.22 meters or 4 feet off the ground floor in containment cell block. Object is not to be contained in areas exceeding 3.66 by 3.05 meters or 12 by 10 feet, nor placed on mahogany, pine, cherry, or aluminum pedestals above or below level 1 of containment cell block. Object can be handled safely, albeit gently, without consequences. Tests and consequences thereof involving containment conditions can be viewed in Section B35-1 of the attached report. Description Object was found on the shore of the Red Sea, 30th January 1968, emitting a low sigh and a dim blue gleam. Its color has since turned into an orange mix of red, only emitting a hum of varying volume whilst in the presence of female examiners of ages between 34 and 41. SCP-093 resembled the documented blue for 5434 at 123 on 26 April 1986, coincidentally when the body of 1949834 was discovered in an undisclosed research facility. Ties between 1949834 and SCP-093 remain inconclusive, and effects of prolonged exposure to 093 remain unknown, except for infrequent reports of periods of calmness and in the case of 2420049, as periodic waves of depression, loss of balance, and thoughts of suicide. These feelings have reportedly not exceeded 11 days in duration. Objects seemed to react to the presence of 2420056 by turning light violet for no more than 209, as documented on 12th of March, 1993. Effects of this reaction remain unknown. Additional Notes Origins of 093 remain unknown, and documents of recovery of 093 have since been destroyed in a fire in research facility 9th of December, 1989. Reports on the feelings of researchers who handled 093 have remained inconsequential since 19th of April, 1995. SCP-093-T1 Containment Test Testing of SCP-093 against conditions set forth for existing containment procedures to assess viability of continuing such containment, beginning with changing the type of mirror used as a position of rest. Mirrored Surface Brass Frame Retail Grade Mirror SCP-093 rests without activity when placed on the mirror. This test alone removes the need for costly silver or wooden containment systems. Standard Grade Table SCP-093 turns upright and begins to roll across the table surface in one direction, making a U-turn and rolling to the other, completing an oval shape, and repeating this action until a mirror is brought into the vicinity of it, at which time SCP-093 rolls toward the mirror and lays flatways against it, sliding toward the center. It is noted that despite the grainy feel of SCP-093, it does not mark the mirror in any fashion while moving across it. Two mirrors at either end of a standard grade table. SCP-093 gravitates towards the closer mirror regardless of orientation and makes no distinction between different types of mirrors, favoring a factor of distance above all else in choosing the mirror to move to. A mirror held by a person and moved around. SCP-093 follows the mirror as it moves, gaining speed until a maximum velocity is reached. At any velocity, the impact of SCP-093 against a mirrored surface results in no damage to either object. A person holding SCP-093, placing it on a mirror. This test was accidental, the result of one of the staff tripping another after some debate about who would be covering the lunch tab. As a result of the behavior of the researchers, it was discovered that a person holding SCP-093 and placing it against a mirror will in fact move into the mirror. Addendum. Containment testing discontinued after establishing that SCP-093 requires only a mirror to rest inert. Testing on human interaction with mirrors while holding SCP-093, authorized by Dr. SCP-093-T2 Mirror Test Testing Protocols Subjects testing SCP-093 must wear a Class 3 buckle harness strapped to the chest and attached to a tension pulley system, allowing for 300 meters more than 1,000 feet of movement. Additional spools may be added to extend movement if necessary. The clasps connecting these spools must be high-grade 
and capable of withstanding applied force of 0.2 tons. A field kit containing the following should be standard issue for testing of SCP-093. One wrist-mounted light source with three hours lifespan and additional power sources providing up to six additional hours. Four 0.5 liter water bottles with water. Four MREs of any type, plus two plain granola bars, chocolate chips allowed. One standard issue Beretta 9mm firearm with 24 rounds of ammunition, loaded. This is not to be issued until subject is passed into a mirror using SCP-093 and should be given under armed supervision, ensuring that the subject passes through entirely. This item is to be requisitioned first upon subject's return and subject to be made aware of this before leaving line of sight within SCP-093's mirror. One standard issue field knife. The subject is not to be made aware of this item and must find it on his own within the kit. The subject must also be attached to a video system with a camera mounted on the subject's head or shoulders. The video device should be cable-based and allow for the same length of travel as the return system. Wireless cameras have shown mixed results and should only be used in testing conditions where SCP-093 is a currently known color. New colors must be tested using wired feed. During testing, the color of SCP-093 must be recorded, as well as history of the subject in terms of their incarceration, to identify how SCP-093 determines the color to assume. A link appears to be connected to guilt, or a lack thereof, in the subject's psyche. Item Number SCP-106 Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures Revision 11-8 no physical interaction with SCP-106 is allowed at any time. All physical interaction must be approved by no less than a two-thirds vote from O5 Command. Any such interaction must be undertaken in AR-2 maximum security sites, after a general non-essential staff evacuation. All staff, research security, class D, etc., are to remain at least 60 meters away from the containment cell at all times, except in the event of breach events. SCP-106 is to be contained in a sealed container comprised of lead-lined steel. The container will be sealed within 40 layers of identical material, each layer separated by no less than 36 centimeters of empty space. Support struts between layers are to be randomly spaced. Container is to remain suspended, no less than 60 centimeters from any surface, by ELO IID electromagnetic supports. Secondary containment area is to be comprised of 16 spherical cells, each filled with various fluids and a random assembly of surfaces and supports. Secondary containment is to be fitted with light systems, capable of flooding the entire assembly with no less than 80,000 lumens of light instantly, with no direct human involvement. Both containment areas are to remain under 24-hour surveillance. Any corrosion observed on any containment cell surfaces, staff members, or other site locations within 200 meters of SCP-106 are to be reported to site security immediately. Any objects or personnel lost to SCP-106 are to be deemed missing or KIA. No recovery attempts are to be made under any circumstances. Note, continued research and observation have shown that, when faced with highly complex or random assemblies of structures, SCP-106 can be confused showing a marked delay on entry and exit from said structure. SCP-106 has also shown an aversion to direct, sudden light. This is not manifested in any form of physical damage, but a rapid exit to the pocket dimension generated on solid surfaces. These observations, along with those of lead aversion and liquid confusion, have reduced the general escape incidence by 43%. The primary cells have also been effective in recovery incidents requiring recall protocol. Observation is ongoing. Description SCP-106 appears to be an elderly humanoid with a general appearance of advanced decomposition. This appearance may vary, but the rotting quality is observed in all forms. SCP-106 is not exceptionally agile and will remain motionless for days at a time, waiting for prey. SCP-106 is also capable of scaling any vertical surface and can remain suspended upside down indefinitely. When attacking, SCP-106 will attempt to incapacitate prey by damaging major organs, 
muscle groups, or tendons, then pull disabled prey into its pocket dimension. SCP-106 appears to prefer human prey items in the 10 to 25 years of age bracket. SCP-106 causes a corrosion effect in all solid matter it touches, engaging a physical breakdown in materials several seconds after contact. This is observed as rusting, rotting, and cracking of materials in the creation of a black, mucus-like substance, similar to the material coating SCP-106. This effect is particularly detrimental to living tissues and is assumed to be a pre-digestion action. Corrosion continues for six hours after contact, after which the effect appears to burn out. SCP-106 is capable of passing through solid matter, leaving behind a large patch of its corrosive mucus. SCP-106 is able to vanish inside solid matter, entering what is assumed to be a form of pocket dimension. SCP-106 is then able to exit this dimension from any point connected to the initial entry point. Examples Entering the inner wall of a room and exiting the outer wall. Entering a wall and exiting from the ceiling. It is unknown if this is the point of origin for SCP-106 or a simple lair created by SCP-106. Limited observation of this pocket dimension has shown it to be comprised mostly of halls and rooms with data expunged entry. This activity can continue for days, with some subjected individuals being released for the express purpose of hunting, recapture, data expunged. Addendum SCP Review Notes Due to the exceedingly difficult to contain nature of SCP-106, SCP is to be reviewed every three months or during a post-breach incident. Physical restraints are impossible and direct physical damage appears to have no effect on SCP-106. Current SCP revolves around basic observation and immediate response. Previous, more proactive special containment procedures have been recalled due to the events of breaches. Notes on Behavior SCP-106 appears to go through long periods of dormancy in which it will remain completely motionless for up to three months. The cause for this is unknown. However, it has been shown that this appears to be used as a lulling tactic. SCP-106 will emerge from this state in a very agitated state and will attack and abduct staff and cause gross damage to its containment cell on the site at large. Recall Protocol Data Expunged SCP-106 appears to hunt and attack based on desire, not hunger. SCP-106 will attack and collect multiple prey items during a hunting behavior event keeping many alive in the pocket dimension for extended periods of time. SCP-106 has no determinable limit and appears to collect a random number of prey items during an event. The inner dimension accessed by SCP-106 appears to be only accessible by SCP-106. Recording and transmission devices have been shown to still operate inside this dimension, though recordings and transmissions are very degraded. It appears that SCP-106 will play with captured prey and appears to have full control of time, space, and perception inside this dimension. SCP-106 appears data expunged. Recall Protocol In the event of a breach event by SCP-106, a human within the 10 to 25 years of age bracket will be prepped for recall, with the compromised containment cell being replaced and restored for use. When the cell is ready, the lore subject will be injured, preferably via the breakage of a long bone, such as the femur, or the severing of a major tendon, such as the Achilles tendon. Lore subject will then be placed in the prepped cell, and the sound emitted by said subject will be transmitted over the site public address system. SCP-106 will typically begin to gravitate toward the lore subject within 10 to 15 minutes after hearing the subject. Should SCP-106 not respond to the initial broadcast, additional physical trauma is to be administered to lure the subject at 25-minute intervals until SCP-106 responds. Multiple lure subjects may be used in the case of major breach events. SCP-106 will typically enter a dormant state after finishing with a lure subject. In addition, subjects may data expunged. SCP-001 is an O5's tail. Good evening, Doctor. No, no, don't stand up. And yes, I am who you think I am. 
Let's not make any more of this than it is. You know my number, and I know enough about you to make a duplicate that even your mother wouldn't be able to tell apart from the real you. No, that's not a threat, just a fact. Now, as to my business here, it seems you have stumbled upon something above your clearance. Well, no. Stumbled is not the right word. Dug up? Perhaps. And you are getting to the point where further digging would end in some fairly lethal gunshot wounds. This would be a sad state of affairs, as you are otherwise quite a good researcher. Therefore, you are getting something very few people in the Foundation ever get. An explanation. Yes, we were alerted when you first started digging into SCP-001. Every researcher who's been around for a while looks into it. Most are satisfied when they uncover the angel with the flaming sword. It's buried under enough levels. But then, you started looking into the factory, and that is when I knew you wouldn't stop. So, here it is, plain and simple. The factory is SCP-001, but it will never be written up. It was a choice I made early on in the creation of the Foundation and a choice I still stand by. You researchers are far too curious. I'm not sure which scares me worse, that we'll never understand the factory, or that we one day will. Ah, well, I'm sure you're eager to learn more. The factory was built in 1835. Back then, it was known as the Anderson Factory, named after James Anderson, a rather well-to-do industrialist. It was built in, well, We'll just say America, and was the largest factory yet designed, a good mile across at its widest, three stories tall throughout, with a special seven-story tower by the front gate that Anderson lived in. It was designed to be the ultimate factory, capable of taking care of everything, including the housing of workers. People could be born, work, live, and die without ever leaving the confines of the factory. And work they did on everything from cattle raising and slaughtering, to textiles, to everything else under the sun. Now, no one knows whether James Anderson was actually a Satan worshipper. It's just as likely that he followed some kind of pagan gods. What is known is that he was very exact in the building of his factory, and in the placement of his machinery within it. Survivors claim the floor was engraved with arcane symbols, that were only visible when blood flowed across them. But then, the survivors claimed a lot of things. What is known is that Anderson made his money on the blood and sweat, and sometimes body parts, of the lower class. His journals indicate he thought of them as less than human, being put on this earth only to serve his will. Of course, at that time, no one knew about his predilections, and so people flocked to the factory. A place to both work and live at the same time. Well, of course people wanted in. Never mind the harsh hours, working conditions, sadistic security force, and all the rest. Factory workers were forced to work 16-hour days, work only shutting down on Sundays between sunrise and sunset. Workers were not given individual rooms, instead sharing rooms with eight other people, sleeping in shifts of three. Medical attention was unheard of. If you were injured in the course of your duties, which most people were, you were expected to just keep working. Anyone too injured to work was dragged off by the security, never to be heard from again. For 40 years, the Anderson factory cranked out all sorts of things for people. Meat, clothes, weapons. Never mind that the beef might be mixed with human. Don't care that the weapons were forged in blood. No attention need be paid that the clothes were dyed with, well, you get the idea. Rumors leaked out, but the products were so good, why bother? Until someone got out. I never met the brave soul who managed to escape, but she managed to meet with President Grant, and in 1875, he enlisted my aid. At the time I was, well, it doesn't matter. We'll say I was military, kind of and that my people were the same. 150 good men and some few women, who were often given jobs that weren't supposed to be common knowledge. We'd been cleaning out some Confederate holdouts and some of the worst things we found down south. So, 
We did some research, didn't like what we saw, and went in, loaded for bear. I don't actually remember much about the night it all went down. Most of it blends together in my head. I get flashes sometimes of the people chained to the line, living next to dead. Damned hard to tell which was which. Children working underneath machines. The majority of the flesh scoured from their bones by the great wheels and cogs. And the other things. No, I'm alright. I haven't thought about that night for a very long time. The security force wasn't much of a problem. But then, Anderson's creations showed up. He'd been taking the injured workers and, well, experimenting on them. Men, if you could call them men, with multiple arms, sewn together, some of them combined with animals. Horrible monstrosities out of mankind's worst nightmares. They kept coming, wave after wave of not quite living creatures. I lost a lot of good people that night. And then, we found Anderson's breeding pits. Girls as young as eight chained to the walls, forced to be nothing more than... <laughs> I'm sorry. Even today, more than a century later, the memory makes me see red. When we finally found Anderson cowering in his office, we hung him from his tower window with his own entrails. As he died, he laughed, saying it didn't matter. We could kill him, but his factory, the factory, would go on. He was still laughing 24 hours later, when we finally cut him down, had him drawn and quartered, and then burned the remains. The entire time, he uttered blasphemies that I don't like to think about. We spent a week cleaning that place out, freeing the workers, putting down the things we found in the basements in many lightless rooms. We pulled out things that were useful, stocked them in a house near the gate, tried to make sense of everything. A hundred and fifty of us went into that hell pit that night, and only ninety-three came out. By the end of that week, we were down to seventy-one. But the things we found in there, my god. Well, you've been with the Foundation a while, they wouldn't seem as amazing to you, but we found toy guns that shot real bullets, a yo-yo that would flay the skin from anyone it touched, hammers that only worked on human flesh, a breed of skeletal horse that ran faster than anything we'd ever seen, cloaks that seemed woven from the night itself and let men access a shadowy dimension that I, I get away from myself. We found tools, both wondrous and horrible, and we were faced with a choice. I gathered my highest ranking, well, we'll call them officers, to me, and we tried to figure out what we would do. They all had opinions. The chaplain, he had gone a little crazed, thought all these objects must be miracles sent from God, holy relics to be worshipped. Marshall, and his little toady Dawkins thought there was a fortune to be made here, making and selling these things to the highest bidder. The engine we all called Bass, due to his deep speaking voice, he called these things an abomination, and declared that we should hunt down and destroy everything we could find. And Smith thought we should take this stuff back to the president. The only one without an opinion was the old man, but he never said much of anything anyways. We argued for hours days trying to work it out. Me, I thought we were sitting on a gold mine all right, but that we could use these things, these objects, to hunt down some of the scary things we'd run into down south, the other monsters this world had to offer, and use this factory for good, as a place to contain these things, find a way to make them work for our fellow man, or at least protect our fellow man from having to deal with them. I'm sure you can figure out what happened. The chaplain snuck away in the night with his devotees, taking a couple of small items with him. Marshall we kicked out when we found him, abusing his authority. He promised he'd get revenge, and that little Dawkins shit led the rest of their group off with some of the juicier items. Bass and his people tried to light the whole damn thing on fire, then just left when it didn't work, and Smith left to report back to the president. I did manage to get him to promise me he'd tell Grant the factory had been destroyed. I had big plans for that place. Of course, 
It was kind of hard to follow through on big plans when you only have 12 other people to work with. But it was a start. And it worked. For a while, we had these amazing toys. And finding people to work with us was easy. Back then, going off the grid was as simple as leaving town. We knew what we wanted. We knew what we could be. Leventhal set out getting us backing. A simple invention here, some well-invested money there. It all worked out. White and Jones set out getting us other backing. In our previous work, we'd found out some interesting things about people. Some secrets that powerful men didn't want getting out. And with our new position helping keep secrets, we got more people asking us to deal with their secrets. Blackmail is a dirty word, but it works. Bright, Argent, and Lumineu got to work cataloging the items. Light and Bright's wife, the nurse, they made sure we kept ourselves healthy. <laughs> no, it's just remembering Light. She had such unusual ideas about hygiene for the time. Brilliant woman. Chav, Flesher, and Karnoff dealt with training the troops. Tesla and Tamlin were in charge of figuring out how to take advantage of the items without making it obvious. We were amazing. The city we built around the factory, which we took to calling Site Alpha, was self-supporting. Agents, researchers, operatives of all sorts. Not by those names, of course, but those positions. We expanded. <sighs> I'm sorry, I am an old man. I know I do not look it, but the body lies. The mind doesn't always remember right. And sometimes I get lost in my memories. Things get confused, but the long and simple of it is this. We used the factory. It always seemed to have more empty rooms to store things in. Back then, that was the word for them. Things. No skips then, no. We thought we had the factory tamed. That's one of the reasons I refused to quit this job. If there's anything I can do here, it's remind people that we will never tame these things. Contain them, yes, but as we saw with Abel, tame them? Never. After a decade or so, we were pretty organized. The 13 original of us were being called by numbers, not names. We knew how to make things work. And if a thing or two vanished inside of the factory, still? And the occasional D-Class? What? Yes, we had D-Class back then. Disposables. That's where the D comes from. Had to have someone to test things on. Tesla and Tamlin were both very firm about that. But yes, sometimes we lost people who didn't matter. Adam, sorry, Dr. Bright, was fond of saying it was the factory taking its toll. You can't get something for nothing. 1911 was when it all went wrong. Things, we called them fairies. An entire race of things living beside us. They could look the same as you or I. The only obvious difference was an allergy to iron. Yes, that's why we called them fairies. No, you haven't heard of them. Why? Well, because it's the one time the Foundation wiped out an entire race of things. Root and branch. And I'm the one who did it. We'd been hunting them for some time. We'd run into them a time or two before come out on top. So, when a certain royal asked us for help, of course we were eager to get them in our debt. We've always loved having people in our debt. We sent a team to help out, take care of what we thought was a hunting party. The next time we saw them, their heads were on poles, attached to the saddles of the creatures the fairies rode, when they attacked the factory. It was horrible. Three words. But they convey so much. I've never... I'm sorry. Please, give me a moment. <clears throat> I've never told this part to anyone. You should consider yourself lucky. And if you ever tell anyone any of what I'm about to impart on you, I will not just kill you, but everyone who shares your DNA in the worst ways possible. You'll think Procedure 110 Montauk is a walk in the park compared to what I do to you. <sighs> we lost. The things came, and they destroyed us. Rode over our emplacements, slaughtered our people, shrugged off our weapons like they were nothing. 
I watched my 13 go down, left and right, just trying to hold the factory. And I, I, their leader, their friend, their father figure, godfather to the Bright's four young children, confidant, sometimes lover, always the confessor. I ran. I ran like a scared little boy, deep into the dark guts of the factory. I was chased by the things, always just one step ahead. I could hear them behind me, feel their breath upon my neck, and... I came to a door I'd never seen before. A bronze door, covered in Arabic script of some sort. I'd never been one for languages, especially not the curvy bullshit the musclemen use. But I didn't care. They were coming for me, and I threw the door open and dived through it. Everything inside was different. There was a feeling of peace, that nothing could hurt me here. The light was this dark red, but still felt right. My ears were filled with the steady thrumming of a gigantic heartbeat, and in front of me were the remains of Anderson. It spoke to me then, but I'll be damned if I could tell you exactly what it said. What it told me was more meaning than exact. It offered me hope. It told me, it told me that each of the things we had used from the factory, no matter what we did with them, fed it, helped it grow. But if the fairies took the factory, they would destroy it, and we couldn't have that. It offered me a deal. It could remove this event, make it have never happened. All I needed to give it was us. I didn't want to. I knew it was a bad idea, but then I saw them again. My family, my friends, dead. Dead by the hands of those bastards. I agreed. It smiled, and I found myself once more upon the ramparts, watching the horde of fairies crest the hill, my foundation alive once more. In my hands was a weapon. I won't bore you with the details, but we slaughtered them. And, with these new weapons, continued to slaughter them. Everywhere they lived, everywhere they bred. My fellow O5s questioned my decision, thinking we should save some in case we might ever need them. I overruled them. We moved away from the factory, shut it down, moved our things out of there. We changed the name from things to special containment protocols, focused on containing them, not anything else. The others were curious, but understood I had my reasons. I boarded up the factory, locked it shut, buried it under a ton of rubble, saying it was too dangerous. I thought, thought I'd gotten away with it, until I found a thing on my desk. One of the old toy guns that shot real bullets and it had the factory label on it. I've sent people in from time to time to see what it might be doing. Last time I sent people in to look, there was nothing there. We keep finding factory items out there. I can't help but think of how many more we don't find. The people who use them and keep it hidden. I think back to the body telling me how each item used gave energy to the factory. I never asked it. Energy for what? I don't think I want to know. What do we give it? D-class, mostly. Where did you think all those bodies went? There's a place. Bodies are left, and they vanish. Everyone thinks I'm a genius for figuring it out. Sometimes... Sometimes I have defeated other things. Researchers. Agents. They never know it's coming. It just reaches out and takes them. But, in the end... We're doing more good by being here. Whatever the factory wants, whatever it is, we're doing good here. I have to believe that. And now you know. Are you happy? I didn't think so. Why tell you? I'm getting old, Everett. Should I die, someone will have to keep feeding it. Maybe you'll be different. Maybe you'll figure out how to stand up to it. But I doubt it. Item number SCP-035 
Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures SCP-035 is to be kept within a hermetically sealed glass case, no fewer than 10 centimeters, 4 inches thick. This case is to be contained within a steel, iron, and lead shielded room at all times. Doors are to be triple locked at all times, with the exception of allowing personnel in or out. No fewer than two armed guards are to be posted at any time. Guards must remain outside at all times, and are not allowed within the containment room under any circumstances. A trained psychologist is to remain on site at all times. Research personnel are not to touch SCP-035 at any time. SCP-035 must be moved to a new sealed case every two weeks. The previous case must be disposed of via SCP-101, as it shows no adverse reactions to SCP-035's corruption. Anyone who comes into contact with SCP-035 when it is in possession of a host is to be given an immediate psychological evaluation. Description SCP-035 appears to be a white porcelain comedy mask, although, at times, it will change to tragedy. In these events, all existing visual records, such as photographs, video footage, even illustrations of SCP-035 automatically change to reflect its new appearance. A highly corrosive and degenerative viscous liquid constantly seeps from the eye and mouth holes of SCP-035. Anything coming into contact with this substance slowly decays over a period of time, depending on the material, until it has decayed completely into a pool of the original contaminant. Glass seems to react the slowest to the effects of the item, hence the construction choice of its immediate container. Living organisms that come into contact with the substance react much the same way, with no chance of recovery. Origin of the liquid is unknown. Liquid is only visible from the front, and does not emerge or is even visible from the other side. Subjects within 1.5 to 2 meters, 5 or 6 feet, of SCP-035, or in visual contact with it, experience a strong urge to put it on. When SCP-035 is placed on the face of an individual, an alternate brainwave pattern from SCP-035 overlaps that of the original host, effectively snuffing it out and causing brain death to the subject. Subject then claims to be the consciousness contained within SCP-035. The bodies of possessed subjects decay at a highly accelerated rate, eventually becoming little more than mummified corpses. Nevertheless, SCP-035 has demonstrated the ability to remain in cognitive control of a body, experiencing severe structural damage, even if the subject's body literally decays to the point where motion is not mechanically possible. No effect is found to be had when placed on the face of an animal. Conversations with SCP-035 have proven to be informative. Researchers have learned various details about other SCP objects and history in general, as SCP-035 claims to have been at many momentous events. SCP-035 displays a highly intelligent and charismatic personality, being both amiable and flattering to all those who speak with it. SCP-035 has scored in the 99th percentile on all intelligence and aptitude tests administered to it and appears to have a photographic memory. However, psychological analysis has discovered SCP-035 to possess a highly manipulative nature, capable of forcing sudden and profound changes to interviewers' psychological state. SCP-035 has proven to be highly sadistic, prompting some to commit suicide and transforming others into near-mindless servants with linguistic persuasion alone. SCP-035 has stated that it has intimate knowledge of the workings of the human mind, and implied that it could change anyone's views if given enough time. Additional Notes SCP-035 was found in a sealed crypt in an abandoned house in Venice, in 18... Addendum 035-01 SCP-035 has been found to be able to possess anything that has a humanoid shape, including mannequins, corpses, and statues. SCP-035 has been able to motivate all into movement, removing the need to expose live subjects to SCP-035. Still, anything it possesses inevitably decays into motionlessness. Addendum 035-02 
SCP-035 has facilitated an escape attempt, convincing several of the research staff to aid it in its bid for freedom. Insurrection failed. All staff that have been in contact with SCP-035 have been terminated, and mandatory psychiatric evaluations have been implemented for all personnel coming in contact with SCP-035. Addendum 035-03 It has been determined that SCP-035 is capable of telepathy, whether or not it possesses a host, even penetrating to the subconscious of others and using the knowledge it finds to its advantage. Extreme caution is advised when choosing subjects to converse with SCP-035. Addendum 035-04 SCP-035 has expressed an interest in other SCPs, most notably SCP-4715 and SCP-682. Dr. has expressed worry that should SCP-035 bond with either, their regenerative qualities would negate its corruption and give it a permanent host. Addendum 035-05 After several more escape attempts, and after reviewing SCP-035's incident record, High Command has ordered that it be permanently sealed within the facility and prohibited from being allowed any more hosts. Several personnel have protested against this, with some even erupting into violence. As a direct result, all personnel that have come into contact with SCP-035 have been terminated. Going forward, all personnel that deal with SCP-035 are to be rotated frequently, and contact is to be limited even to its dormant state to as little as possible. Addendum 035-06 Personnel within 10 meters of SCP-035 have recently reported feeling unease, stating that they can hear unintelligible whispering. Several others have suffered from severe migraines. Object has been monitored, but there is no change in its dormant behavior, and no sounds have been recorded. The motion to reinstate SCP-035's host privileges has been brought up once more, if only on a temporary basis, to discover these new changes in the object's behavior. Denied. Addendum 035-07 The walls of SCP-035's containment cell have suddenly begun secreting a black substance. Tests on the substance have revealed it to be human blood, although highly contaminated with several foreign and unknown agents. Substance is corrosive, having a pH balance of 4.5, and prolonged exposure to the walls has proven to be detrimental to their structural integrity. More notably, it seems to be forming patterns on the walls. Several segments seem to be paragraphs in various languages, including Italian, Latin, Greek, and Sanskrit. Translation is pending. Other segments appear to be diagrams depicting ritualistic sacrifice and mutilation, often for the arcane benefit of the person committing them. Several staff members have been shocked to note that all of the sacrifices bear an uncanny resemblance to various personnel and their loved ones, often in conflicting positions. Researchers while in the room examining these newly formed patterns have complained of hearing loud whispering and high-pitched, unnerving laughter at irregular intervals. Personnel in the section working daily near and around SCP-035's containment unit have suffered catastrophic morale damage, with an all-time high in suicide rates in staff in that area, whether or not they have ever had contact with SCP-035. The only change in SCP-035's dormant behavior is regarding its contained glass case. Degradation of the case has increased to a high degree, enough so that the glass will occasionally shatter causing a wide dispersal of SCP-035's contaminant. This occurs quite often at the most inopportune times, so far resulting in six casualties and three fatalities of both research and cleanup staff. Addendum 035-08 In light of the mass suicide and homicide of the members of the research team tasked with translating the passages garnered from SCP-035's containment cell, the morale damage in the area and general loss of staff dealing with SCP-035 to either death or insanity, it has been decided to coat the inner and outer walls of its containment cell with SCP-148, which has proved well in the containment of SCP-132, in order to hopefully block out the high levels of negativity being emitted by SCP-035. Addendum 035-09 
The use of SCP-148 has worked well, causing morale and suicide rates to return to near pre-SCP-035 rates. However, the material appears to facilitate the negativity within the cell, causing a veritable greenhouse effect inside. Personnel inside the cell have stated that they feel a heavy sense of dread, fear, anger, and general depression, as well as hearing constant, nearly inaudible whispering upon immediate entry. A prolonged stay causes severe migraines, suicidal tendencies, heavy hemorrhaging of blood vessels around the eyes and inside the mouth and nose, general hostility to others, and for the whispering to increase to almost deafening volumes, intersected by a constant mocking laughter. Exposure of more than three hours inevitably results in the subject falling into a deep psychosis and attempting to harm either themselves or others. Most spoke in Latin or Greek, despite the fact that several did not previously know how to speak said languages beforehand. The presence of blood in both word and diagram formations has increased disproportionately, the walls becoming cluttered and the formations beginning to overlap each other. The substance has proven to be both difficult to clean and even more corrosive than was originally recorded, with a pH of roughly 2.4. General estimation gives the current walls a life of two months before they will need replacement. It is becoming gradually more and more difficult to contain SCP-035 and the debate to reinstate its host privileges has once again come up. Denied. Addendum 035-10 The walls, ceiling, and floor of SCP-035's containment cell have now been completely saturated in blood. All personnel entering and guarding the area must wear full hazmat protection suits. Constant cleaning efforts are being instated. Addendum 035-11 The magnitude, intensity, and recurrence of the phenomena that occur within SCP-035's containment cell have increased to an alarming degree. The cell door has been known to become locked of its own accord while personnel are inside and unable to be opened for a period of time. Appendages form out of the larger puddles of blood, and often attempt to grab or harm personnel near them. Blurry apparitions have started appearing to staff. Electronic devices no longer work inside the cell, and the light cannot be turned on, though there is no physical reason why it does not work, forcing those entering to use non-electric-based light sources. Cleaning measures are having no discernible effect on the cell, and the walls are degrading at a very high rate forcing them to be replaced within a week at best, although the blood makes it nearly impossible to properly achieve this. SCP-035 may have to be moved to a new cell entirely, with the old one sealed off and disengaged from the rest of the facility. Item Number SCP-002 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-002 is to remain connected to a suitable power supply at all times, to keep it in what appears to be a recharging mode. In case of electrical outage, the emergency barrier between the object and the facility is to be closed, and the immediate area evacuated. Once facility power is re-established, alternating bursts of X-ray and ultraviolet light must strobe the area, until SCP-002 is reaffixed to the power supply and returned to recharging mode. Containment area is to be kept at negative air pressure at all times. Teams including a minimum of two members are required within 20 meters of SCP-002 or its containment area. Personnel should maintain physical contact with one another at all times to confirm there is another person present, as perception may be dulled, skewed, or influenced by proximity to the object. No personnel below level 3 are permitted within SCP-002. This requirement may be waived via written authorization from two off-site Level 4 administrators. Command staff issued such a waiver must be escorted by at least five Level 3 security personnel for the duration of their contact and must temporarily surrender their rank and security clearance. Following contact, command staff will be escorted at least five kilometers from SCP-002 to undergo a 72-hour quarantine and psychological evaluation. If deemed fit for return to duty by psych staff, rank and security clearance may be restored when quarantine expires. Description: SCP-002 resembles a tumorous fleshy growth with a volume of roughly 60 meters cubed 
or 2,000 feet cubed. An iron valve hatch on one side leads to its interior, which appears to be a standard low-rent apartment of modest size. One wall of the room possesses a single window, though no such opening is visible from the exterior. The room contains furniture which, upon close examination, appears to be sculpted bone, woven hair, and various other biological substances produced by the human body. All matter tested thus far show independent or fragmented DNA sequences for each object in the room. Refer to the Molhausen Report for details related to objects' discovery. Reference To date, subject has been responsible for the disappearances of seven personnel. It has also in its time at the facility further furnished itself with two lamps, a throw rug, a television, a radio, a beanbag chair, three books in an unknown language, four children's toys, and a small potted plant. Tests with a variety of lab animals including higher primates have failed to provoke a response in SCP-002. Cadavers as well fail to produce any effect. Whatever process the subject uses to convert organic matter into furnishings is apparently only facilitated by the introduction of living humans. The Mulhausen Report The following is a brief report detailing the discovery of SCP-002. Subject was discovered in a small crater in northern Portugal where it struck the Earth from orbit. Encased in a shell of thick rock, the fleshy exterior of the object was exposed by the impact. A native farmer happened upon the site and reported his findings to the village elder. Subject gained SCP attention when a level 4 agent posted in the area detected a small radioactive anomaly generated by the object. A collection squad of SCP security personnel, led by General Mulhausen, was immediately dispatched to the area, where they quickly secured the subject in a large container and performed initial testing with subjects recruited from the nearby village. Three men individually sent into the structure subsequently disappeared. Upon discovering this deadly property of the subject, General Mulhausen issued a Level 4A termination order of any witnesses, roughly one-third of the village, to ensure no outside knowledge of the object, and initiated its transport to SCP facility Data Expunged. During preparation for transport, four SCP security personnel were inexplicably drawn inside the object, where they too immediately disappeared. Following inspection, it appeared as if the object had grown several new furnishings, and was beginning to look like the interior of an apartment room. General Mulhausen immediately ordered the requisition of several Class III hazmat suits for the remaining security team members, who proceeded to lift the container onto a waiting freight ship for transport to the SCP containment facility. Data expunged. Data expunged. Following the termination of General Mulhausen, SCP-002 was re-secured by SCP staff and brought into special containment and classified, where it currently resides. Staff with clearance below Level 3 have been denied access to the SCP-002 container without prior approval of at least two Level 4 staff after the Mulhausen incident. Item Number SCP-085 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures Revised. SCP-085 is to be contained in a single chalk white bond drawing pad in a secure containment facility. Supervised contact with SCP-085 is unrestricted to all personnel with level 2 access. All personnel coming into contact with SCP-085 are subject to searches and random psych analysis upon entering or leaving the containment area. Absolutely no paper or canvas media are allowed to exit SCP-085's containment room. Any paper trash must be disposed of by incineration, after careful inspection. Paper and art supplies are to be brought in only by authorized personnel. In case of fire, flames are smothered using a rapid atmospheric replacement and CO2 dumping system. Personnel are advised to quickly secure an oxygen mask and tank from the wall at the first sign of smoke or fire to prevent asphyxiation, as this procedure cannot be halted until all fires are suppressed. Description SCP-085 is the result of an experiment conducted between SCP-067 and SCP-914. Using SCP-067, test subject 1101F drew a single female figure, about 15 centimeters or 6 inches in height, 
and 3.8 centimeters or 1.5 inches wide, in summer dress, with long hair pulled back into a ponytail, with the name Cassandra written underneath. Dr. Expunged proposed using SCP-914 on various settings on images created by SCP-067. Using the Fine setting, the Cassandra sketch was transmuted into her present form, a sentient black-and-white animated young woman, drawn in clean strokes. Further attempts to duplicate this result have been unsuccessful. SCP-085 prefers to be called Cassie. She is completely sentient, and, as of aware of her 2D form and her limitations in a three-dimensional world. Although her voice is inaudible, she has learned to communicate with SCP Foundation personnel through sign language and writing. SCP-085 may be communicated with by writing text on the paper she exists on. Personnel report that she is amicable and motivated, albeit lonely. SCP-085 can interact with any drawn object on the same page as if it were real. For example, she is able to wear drawn clothing, drive sketched cars, and drink painted beverages. Except for animals and people, any drawn object becomes animated when in contact with SCP-085, but immediately ceases and holds position once out of contact. Artwork initially depicted as in motion, such as ocean waves and swaying trees, animate to an equilibrium state and stay at rest until acted upon by SCP-085. SCP-085 has also demonstrated the ability to transfer from one sheet or image to another, as long as the two are flush. In the event SCP-085 enters a picture that does not support drawn objects, such as a repeating pattern, the picture is converted to a background image. SCP-085 perceives the picture as an endless plane of the image drawn upon it. At the present time, SCP-085 can only exist upon paper or canvas surfaces. SCP-085 cannot transfer onto photos, cardboard, glass, or parchment. When entering other pieces of art, SCP-085 takes on the artistic style of her new environment, whether it be a comic book, an oil painting, watercolor, or charcoal sketching. Note, in comic form, her voice is visible as thought and voice bubbles around her head in typical comic fashion, and as she moves between panels, the perspective and her relative size are altered appropriately. Document 085-1 Introduction to several prints authored by M.C. Escher Researcher Cassandra, this is known as Ascending and Descending. What do you think? At this point, SCP-085 walks a few times around the staircase. SCP-085, it's pretty I guess, would make a neat exercise track. Researcher you see nothing inconsistent with the staircase. SCP-085 No. As far as I can tell, it just loops around down and up all the time. Why don't more staircases do that? It's pretty neat. After this session, SCP-085 requested several impossible objects in her own environment. These requests are pending 05 review. Document 085-2 Incident 085-A Prior to... SCP-085 was unaware of its status as a two-dimensional object in a three-dimensional world. Prior security protocols required that SCP-085 be kept unaware of its true nature in order to prevent psychological distress. Discrepancies with the perceived real world were presented as dreams or nightmares, and an effort was made to present SCP-085 with a scenario in which it was the last surviving human in a post-apocalyptic world, searching for survivors. The deception was quickly broken, following an incident where an SCP Foundation researcher accidentally brought a hard copy of SCP-085 Special Containment Procedures Report into the containment facility and allowed it to contact the artifact's current location. SCP-085 transferred onto the document before the researcher could remove it and was immediately made aware of its true nature. Because of the containment breach, several researchers advocated immediate destruction of the artifact. The decision was appealed to the O5 Council, which advocated for SCP-085's continued existence. Since the revelation of her true nature, observers have noted that SCP-085 has begun to show signs of clinical depression. Psychotherapy has been proposed, but the nature of the artifact's state of existence may make it difficult. 
Some success has been had by providing SCP-085 tangible means to distract herself from her condition. In addition to the aforementioned optical illusions, SCP-085 expressed particular interest in a set of technical drawings for a 1964 Ford Mustang convertible, transferring the parts one by one to a more naturalistic artwork, then assembling the vehicle by hand over the period of a year, gasoline being provided through a Norman Rockwell print of a gas station attendant. Requests for further diversions of this nature are pending O5 level review and approval. Item Number SCP-049 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-049 is contained within a standard secure humanoid containment cell in Research Sector 02 at Site 19. SCP-049 must be sedated before any attempts to transport it. During transport, SCP-049 must be secured within a Class 3 humanoid restriction harness, including a locking collar and extension restraints, and monitored by no fewer than two armed guards. While SCP-049 is generally cooperative with most Foundation personnel, outbursts or sudden changes in behavior are to be met with elevated force. Under no circumstances should any personnel come into direct contact with SCP-049 during these outbursts. In the event SCP-049 becomes aggressive, the application of lavender has been shown to produce a calming effect on the entity. Once calmed, SCP-049 generally becomes compliant and will return to containment with little resistance. In order to facilitate the ongoing containment of SCP-049, the entity is to be provided with the corpse of a recently deceased animal, typically a bovine or other large mammal, once every two weeks for study. Corpses that become instances of SCP-049-2 are to be removed from SCP-049's containment cell and incinerated. SCP-049 is no longer permitted to interact with human subjects, and requests for human subjects are to be denied. Temporary Containment Procedure Update Per Containment Committee Order 049.S19.17.1, SCP-049 is no longer permitted to interact directly with any members of Foundation staff, nor is it to be provided with any additional corpses to be used in its surgeries. This order shall persist indefinitely, until such time a consensus regarding the ongoing containment of SCP-049 can be reached. Description SCP-049 is a humanoid entity roughly 1.9 meters in height, which bears the appearance of a medieval plague doctor. While SCP-049 appears to be wearing the thick robes and the ceramic mask indicative of that profession, the garments instead seem to have grown out of SCP-049's body over time. The robes and gloves are identical to a thick hide, built up on the skin, while the mask is composed of a kind of chitin growing out of the bones of the face and are now nearly indistinguishable from whatever form is beneath them. X-rays indicate that despite this, SCP-049 does have a humanoid skeletal structure beneath its outer layer. SCP-049 is capable of speech in a variety of languages, though it tends to prefer English or medieval French. The entity claims to have originated in 15th century France, though admits that it is particularly well-traveled. While SCP-049 is generally cordial and cooperative with Foundation staff, it can become especially irritated, or at times, outright aggressive, if it feels that it is in the presence of what it calls the Pestilence. Although the exact nature of this Pestilence is currently unknown to Foundation researchers, it does seem to be an issue of immense concern to SCP-049. SCP-049 will become hostile with individuals it sees as being affected by the pestilence, often having to be restrained should it encounter such. If left unchecked, SCP-049 will generally attempt to kill any such individual. SCP-049 is capable of causing all biological functions of an organism to cease through direct skin contact. How this occurs is currently unknown, and autopsies of SCP-049's victims have invariably been inconclusive. SCP-049 has expressed frustration or remorse after these killings, indicating that they have done little to kill the pestilence, 
Though we'll usually seek to then perform a crude surgery on the corpse using the implements contained within a black doctor's bag it carries on its person at all times. The space within this bag is seemingly anomalously large, as SCP-049 has been observed pulling objects larger than the bag itself from within it in order to operate on deceased subjects. While these surgeries are not always successful, they often result in the creation of instances of SCP-049-2. SCP-049-2 instances are reanimated corpses that have been operated on by SCP-049. These instances do not seem to retain any of their prior memories or mental functions, having only basic motor skills and response mechanisms. While these instances are generally inactive, moving very little and in a generally ambulatory fashion, they can become extremely aggressive if provoked, or if directed to by SCP-049. SCP-049-2 instances express active biological functions, though these are vastly different from currently understood human physiology. Despite these alterations, SCP-049 often remarks that these subjects have been cured. Addendum 049.1 Discovery SCP-049 was discovered during the investigation of a series of unknown disappearances in the town of Montauban in southern France. During a raid on a local home, investigators found several instances of SCP-049-2, as well as SCP-049. While law enforcement personnel engaged the hostile 049-2 instances, SCP-049 was noted as watching the engagement and taking notes in its journal. After all of the 049-2 instances were dispatched, SCP-049 willingly entered Foundation custody. SCP-049 Upon Discovery The following interview was conducted by Dr. Raymond Hamm during the initial investigation. Interviewer Dr. Raymond Hamm Site 85 Interviewee SCP-049 Begin Log Alors, comment devriez-vous donc commencer une introduction? Is that... is that French? Can we get a translator? The King's English. No need for translation, sir. I can speak it well enough. Good. My name is Dr. Raymond Ham, and I... Ah, uh, a doctor. A like-minded individual, no doubt. Wherein is your speciality, sir? Cryptobiology. Why? <laughs> a medical man such as myself. Wonders abound. And here, I worried I had been abducted by common street thugs. This place, then, this is your laboratory. I had wondered, as clean as it is, and with such little trace of the pestilence here. The pestilence? What do you mean? The scourge. The great dying. Come now, you know the... What is it they call it? The... The... Yeah. Ah, no matter. The pestilence, yes. It abounds outside these walls, you know. So many have succumbed, and many more will continue to, until such time as a perfect cure can be developed. Fortunately, I am very close. It is my duty in life to rid the world of it, you see. The cure to end all cures. When you say the great dying, are you talking about the bubonic plague? I don't know what that is. Uh, I see. Right, well, the entities our agents encountered at the house, uh, they were dead when you encountered them. Yes, you reanimated them. Mm. In a manner of speaking, you see things too simply, Doctor. Expand your horizons. Life and death. Sickness and health. These are amateur terms for amateur physicians. There is only one ailment that exists in the world of men, and that is the pestilence, and nothing else. Make no mistake, they were very ill. All of them. You think you cured those people? Indeed. My cure is most effective. But the things we recovered were not human. Yes, well, it is not a perfect cure. But that will come with time, 
and further experimentation. I have spent a lifetime developing my methods, Dr. Ham, and will spend a lifetime more if necessary. Now, we have wasted too much time. There is work to do. I will require a laboratory of my own, one where I can continue my research unimpeded. And assistance, of course, though I can provide those on my own in time. <laughs> oh, I don't think our organization would be willing to- Nonsense. We are all men of science. That's your coat and show me to my quarters, Doctor. Our work begins now. End log. Interviewer's note. While SCP-049 is capable of communicating in a very human way, there is a strange sense of unease that one experiences when in its presence. Make no mistake, there is something very uncanny about this entity indeed. Additionally, we've confiscated that pointed stick that SCP-049 keeps waving around. Part of this was due to standard confiscation protocols for the possessions of anomalies. In part, because 049 really is a menace swinging it around like he does. The entity was displeased at first, but after we made some concessions in providing it with test subjects, which are admittedly more for the benefit of our own research, it warmed up to the idea. Addendum 049.2 Observation Log While in containment at Site-19, SCP-049 has spent a considerable amount of time studying and performing surgery on the various mammalian corpses it has been provided. SCP-049 will routinely spend several days performing surgery, and then, regardless of whether or not the corpse becomes an instance of SCP-049-2, spending several more days documenting its findings in a thick leather journal stored within its doctor's bag. SCP-049 will often seek to share its findings with members of Foundation staff. Notably, SCP-049's journals are not written in any known language, and attempts by linguists and codebreakers to decipher them have been unsuccessful. The following is a log of several occasions during which SCP-049 was observed operating on a mammalian corpse. Observational Log 049.ol.1 Summary Subject SCP-049 Preface A test subject D-85123 was introduced into SCP-049's containment cell. The entity expressed sincere gratitude towards all members of the containment and research staff. Observation Notes SCP-049 began by asking D-85123 several standard medical questions as it began removing tools from its bag. Shortly after finishing its preparations, SCP-049 quickly closed the distance between the two, killing the subject with a touch to its throat. Afterwards, SCP-049 made a number of considerable alterations to the basic structure of the subject's corpse, often introducing fluids from within its bag into the subject by way of a hand-powered pump and copper tubing. The resulting 049-2 instance became animated flailing and grasping at the walls of the chamber with a number of manufactured limbs, while moaning out of an oblong orifice now present in its sternum. During this time, SCP-049 was observed taking notes of the instance in its journal, and remarking to the watching research staff about the efficacy of its cure. Security personnel entered the chamber to move SCP-049 back to containment, and were attacked by the instance. The security team dispatched the 049-2 instance, and SCP-049 returned to containment with no resistance, stating that it was pleased with the results. Observational Log 049.ol.2 Summary Subject SCP-049 Preface SCP-049 was provided the corpse of a recently deceased goat. SCP-049 expressed gratitude at the provision. Observation Notes SCP-049 operated on the goat corpse for several days, eventually resulting in an instance of SCP-049-2. SCP-049 expressed pleasure in this outcome, though admitted the disease was still in its nascent stage. My veterinarian practice is rudimentary, but the patient responded well to the procedure. Observational Log 049.ol.3 Summary Subject 
SCP-049 Preface SCP-049 was provided the corpse of a recently deceased orangutan. SCP-049 expressed noted gratitude at the provision due to the similarities between the orangutan and common human physiology. Observation Notes SCP-049 spent several days operating on the orangutan, reanimating it several times. However, SCP-049 appeared to be discontent with the results it experienced, returning to the creature three times after its initial reanimation for additional work. After it was unable to reanimate the corpse a fifth time, SCP-049 turned the corpse over to Foundation staff for incineration, stating, I have learned so much from this. Though I fear my early optimism was misplaced, I hadn't yet come across such a… a stumbling block on my road to the cure. More subjects like this would do a great deal in advancing my research. Observational Log 049.ol.7 Full Subject SCP-049 Preface SCP-049 was provided the corpse of a recently deceased bovine. SCP-049 expressed mild annoyance at the provision, though accepted it nonetheless. SCP-049 had stated its desire to work on human subjects several times between this occasion and the earlier provision of an orangutan, noting its discontentedness when they would not be provided. Observation Notes SCP-049 spent several days operating on the bovine corpse, breaking only to dine on a requested dinner of thin crackers, salted pork, and hard cheese. SCP-049 has expressed that it does not require sustenance, but enjoys it and feels that the food helps to put it in the right mind to operate. Beginning first by embalming the corpse, SCP-049 was observed producing a number of long syringes from its bag, each containing a different dark viscous fluid. SCP-049 described these fluids as essences of the humors and elaborated by saying, the pestilence may bring about a systemic imbalance. In such a case, before true healing can begin, one must find the humors in balance, or the body will reject the cure. SCP-049 added to this statement by saying, This is, of course, elementary knowledge for the practical physician. I would have thought you would have learned this during your education. Over the next few days, SCP-049 spent a considerable amount of time adjusting the organs of the bovine corpse with a number of large metal instruments. After eight days, SCP-049 produced a lightning rod, which Dr. Ham exchanged for an electric cattle prod attached to an extension cord, and struck the corpse in several locations. This action seemingly had the effect of reanimating the bovine, which once again became ambulatory, despite the inversion of the head and reorientation of its limbs. Follow-up interview. Begin log. We've watched you work for several weeks now, and honestly, I'm not sure I understand what you're doing. Could you describe your process in detail? Oh, goodness, no. The process is most intensive. As I said to your assistant, the best instruction you will find about my methods are here in my journals as I have kept exhaustive records of my work there. Oh, I see. Well, my concern, Doctor, is that we still don't understand what you're seeking to cure, or how it manifests, or how turning these creatures into quasi-living, mindless drones helps in that effort. You do not understand the pestilence, even after all this time. Doctor, it is an unspeakable horror, one that has shown its true face many times before, and will again. I find myself blessed with the wisdom and good senses needed to root it out and destroy it. But many, like yourself, cannot. It is a cruel judgment, I fear, to be at the mercy of a disease you cannot fully comprehend. That still doesn't answer my question. How's your cure any kind of cure at all? It is a cure. You may laugh at my efforts if you please, but do not besmirch the good name of scientific progress that has developed this great mercy. What you short-sightedly see here is a life better than any this creature could have hoped for. Stricken as it was with the pestilence, this creature is now clean. 
unable to spread the pestilence, and free from the terror it would have experienced otherwise. This is hardly a creature at all, Doctor. It's not even- Do not jape with me, sir. You and your colleagues are like so many others, unable to look past minor setbacks to see the salvation taking place before your very eyes. Do you wait to remove rotten timbers until the hall collapses on top of you? No. You find them and you pull them out and replace them with those untouched by rot. And most of all, you do not simply mock the structure because it now looks different to you. It is strong. It is free of disease. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to agitate you. I'm, I'm just trying to understand. Yes. Well, do mind your words in the future, Doctor. I am a professional, but even professionals may feel the bite of pride in dealing with criticism of their masterpiece. I will forgive this as an act of good faith between colleagues. Is there anything else I can help you with? No, that will be all. Another test subject on the usual schedule. You know my preference of subjects with more human anatomies. End log. Attending researcher's note. SCP-049 does seem to genuinely want to help other humans, though it has not yet been able to provide a concrete example of what exactly it is trying to save us all from. I have watched it now over several weeks, and while the outcomes do not seem to ever change, SCP-049 continues to claim that it is growing closer to its perfect cure. I think the entity may be more aware of the reality of these outcomes than it would like us to think. Addendum 049.3 04-16-2017 Incident Starting shortly after SCP-049's initial containment, Dr. Ham conducted a number of interviews with the subject regarding its anomalous properties, and over time began to note its displeasure with its subjects and the SCP-049-2 instances. This continued for a period of several months during which SCP-049 never exhibited any aggressive behaviors. On April 16, 2017, as Dr. Ham was entering SCP-049's test chamber to conduct another routine interview, the entity began to grow anxious and asked Dr. Ham if he was feeling well. Following protocol, Dr. Ham reminded SCP-049 that the interview was required, after which the entity became hostile and attacked Dr. Ham, killing him. Due to a lapse in security protocol, and because Dr. Ham did not activate the in-chamber emergency system, Dr. Ham's corpse was not discovered until three hours later, by which point SCP-049 had converted it into an instance of SCP-049-2. In the aftermath of this incident, SCP-049 was interviewed by Dr. Theron Sherman. Interviewer, Dr. Theron Sherman, Site-42. Interviewee, SCP-049. Begin log. I need you to explain yourself. SCP-049, you are being directed to explain your actions, and I will remind you that failure to cooperate will result in further restrictions during your containment. My actions do not need to be explained. You killed Raymond Ham and then butchered him until he- Not dead. No, not, not dead. He is, he is cured. Cured? Cured of what? The pestilence, sir. I had thought you, at least, would realize what luck it is. I detected it before. What pestilence? You keep going on and on about this pestilence, but you have not once been able to properly identify this disease. What could you have possibly seen in him today that you had not seen so many times before? That it would be worth his life? He... The pestilence presents and progresses in unforeseeable fashions and has a queer way of... of creeping into the unprepared. And... Call it what you want, Doctor. It was a mercy I did to him. He is cured. He is a vegetable. I... I would not expect you to understand. You and your, your ilk have proven time and time again not to be men of science, but men of, of emotion. You cannot appreciate the horrors I have seen. 
Those many millions who have succumbed to the pestilence have been changed. Your cure cost Ray his life! No, good sir. I have saved it. You will allow this world to slip back into the, the despair of disease and death, ignoring that I have created a miracle. And what disease? What pestilence? He was a healthy man. He was a good doctor. I'm offering it freely to the afflicted. You are not worth this argument, sir. You are short-sighted and foolish. Dr. Ham was sick, and I... I cured him. I am the only one who can do this. My work must continue. There is still so much to learn, so much I've to had do. enough of this. And Consider your allowances were saved. Even you. Welcome uh, to containment, you know, 049. So might be saved. We're done here. I can save them all. I can cast down this plague once and for all. I can do this. Only me. I am. I saved him. I saved him. <sighs> Dr. Ham. I... I cured him. He was sick. I know he was sick. I know he was. And I... You are all sick. But I... I can save you. I can save all of you. Because I... I... am the cure. End log. Addendum 049.4 Post-Incident Report Interview the following interview is an excerpt from the 4-16-17-049 incident report. The interview was conducted by Dr. Elijah Itkin and took place three weeks after the start of the initial investigation. Date: 5717. Interviewer: Dr. Elijah Itkin. Interviewee: SCP-049. Begin log. SCP-049. We are conducting this interview to close out our investigation of your actions taken on April 16th that resulted in the death of a staff member. Do you have any comments to make? Only that I look forward to the day when you will allow me to resume my work. I have spent the last few weeks compiling my notes and constructing a new theory for how the pestilence was able to infect someone in such an insidious manner that I nearly couldn't detect it. Have you experienced any remorse for your actions? For the death of Dr. Ham? Ah, oh, yes. Well, the death of a colleague is always regrettable. But in the face of the pestilence, we must be swift, Doctor, and act without hesitation. Dr. Sherman noted in his report that you seemed to be mournful during your initial interview. Mourn? Perhaps. I had not thought that. It is lamentable that a fellow doctor became infected, but the work continues. Regrettable as, as it was, Dr. Ham's death provided important insight. Living human subjects are the only way to proceed forward, I am decided. My cure is of little use on dead flesh, and I have gleaned all I can from your generous supply of corpses. My desires turn towards tending to those still living who suffer from the disease. I'm afraid you're going to be disappointed. <laughs> oh, Doctor. I wouldn't be so sure. End log. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now, and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.